Hello, everyone, and welcome back to season two of Puck Lines podcast. So uh, I am joined here with my co-host today. Connor, how you doing, buddy? Hey, Andrew. I'm great to be back off a nice summer vacation. Hockey is right around the corner, and it's time that we get back to business. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not so sure that we can call it much of a vacation. We've been up to a, a couple of different things while we've been offline here. Uh, Connor, do you want to catch folks up on what we've been doing this offseason? Yeah, so so far this offseason, we got the YouTube up and running. We started to play with it a little bit before we took our summer break. The good news is it works, it functions, and we will be live and ready to go on there with this podcast. Then on top of that... Yeah, I'm sorry, by the way, that you have to see us fools, uh, but I guess this is this is the next step in the exciting thing uh, of season two. Damn. Uh I mean, at least I'm pretty. No. All right. Your, fine. your family might think you're cute, right? Oh uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> My moms will like this. And then on top of that, the newest and most exciting member to the puck lines podcast family will be a merch shop. Right now we got some general items in there, such as, you know, hats, t-shirts, etc. And we're going to expand on that here in the, the short near future as the season gets rolling. Uh, and like always, you can find us on Twitter and on Facebook at puck lines podcast puck lines pod actually yeah um you know i think it's been a really exciting off season like connor mentioned um we'll have the merch shop you can find that uh on blackandgoldhockey.com uh where you can also find some great writing by yours truly i uh actually am going to make one a little uh, additional plug here for the fact that this year i am going to in addition to be covering the bruins and the providence bruins uh, I'm going to be writing some Boston Pride uh, recaps and news pieces uh, on blackandgoldhockey.com. So be sure to check it out. Be sure to check out the merch shop. Um, help support our show. Help support the site. Uh, and as you said, follow us on you know Twitter, Facebook. Uh, there's an Instagram. I'm not very good at it, but uh, feel free to follow us there. And then as of now, uh, do whatever you do on YouTube. What is that? Follow, like. I don't know. One of those things. Follow, subscribe, like, comment on videos. And if you're doing it on YouTube, you better be doing it on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. Yeah, you got to you got to just do it everywhere. Uh, All right. So let's talk a little bit about the new format of our show. So what we're going to be doing this season is we we heard your feedback. We're definitely going to continue to do primarily Bruins. We are in Boston. We love the Boston Bruins. Connor's not actually in Boston. Boston. Uh, Well, yeah, it's not my fault. You live in a lame state, but we won't get into that. Um, And, you know, for our YouTube uh, listeners, viewers, whatever you are, uh, Connor wearing a Yankees uh, shirt right now has me all worked up. So I apologize for that. You know, we didn't need that kind of negativity coming into this first episode of the season, but he is who he is. And and we, we will just leave him behind in the future. Um, but anyways, uh, <laughs> sorry, buddy. It's, it's, I just had to get your blood pressure up on episode quote unquote one of season yeah, two. Yeah. You know, you just had to piss me off, right? Picking up right where we left off. Great stuff. Amen. Um, all right. So we'll be doing the Bruins. We are going to include a little bit more NHL talk, just kind of around the league, um, giving some insight, talking a little bit about that news. Cause we heard that that's what you want to hear. Uh, and then we are going to separate out the gambling discussion. Uh, so if you're a degenerate and you just want to hear the gambling or you're not a degenerate and you just want to hear the news segments, it will be a little bit easier uh, to find going forward. So hopefully that's helpful for everyone. My plea to you is still please listen to the whole episode. We love you and we we want you here. Uh, even if you don't gamble, it's fun to watch me lose. All right. So let's jump in. Let's talk about the Bruins. Connor, what's the first topic you want to discuss today? Uh, well, let's talk about the Bruins re-signing Zach Seneshin. He got a one-year, $750,000 two-way contract. Now, Seneshin has been somebody who we've talked about quite a bit. Yep. Um, it's kind of the year where he's got to put up or shut up in the Bruins organization. Kind of feel like this is almost like a Ryan Spooner-esque scenario here. Um, 
the only bad part about it is with the Bruins additions in the bottom six, I think it's going to be really tough for him to crack that lineup unless Coyle stumbles and trips. And Co- even if Coyle stumbles and trips, Seneshin's not the guy to, to fix that, I don't believe. Um, so would you consider this a no-risk ad, though? So, so, so hear me out. He doesn't make the lineup. He's going to have to go through waivers. Is he good enough to potentially get picked up by another team? I think he might be, especially if he makes any sort of showing at camp. I mean, listen, and, and, and I'm, I'm really upset here because I really want to continue to finish this pile of pretzels I was eating, but we're recording, so I'm trying to behave. Um, I've had one. I've got one more left, folks, so you're going to see me mute myself on YouTube and eat a pretzel. Um, exciting, though, that I think he's probably gone. And we can finally stop talking about him because I think he's going to make it through camp. Hopefully he looks all right. And somebody picks him up off waivers because that's the best thing that can happen for the Bruins, in my opinion, because stashing him in Providence doesn't really mean a lot to me. Um, it's always nice it's, to have assets. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nice to have assets. He would certainly contribute in Providence, which would be great. Um, but I don't know that. I don't know that his long-term value is where you were hoping it was going to be. And as illogical as my argument is right now, the real reason is I just want to stop talking about him. And I want to stop talking about the 2015 draft. Like I'm just, I'm done with the 2015 draft. You people won't stop tagging me in your 2015 draft takes. Like I don't care. It's over. So let's move on. And if he goes, I see that as moving on, but Maybe I'm being a little too cynical. I, it would be nice for him to be in Providence. He's not making this lineup, though. Like, no. can we all admit that? He's not making this lineup. With what they did this offseason, they pretty much penciled him out of the lineup unless there's some significant injuries. And, and I just, again, with the waiver process, I can't see him making it out of it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's not as good as I think he is. Right. Like maybe maybe other teams don't want him, but I mean, if you if you look at teams like uh, Detroit, um, the Sabres, the Coyotes, they're all bottom barrel teams who could easily go and claim somebody like Seneshin, hoping that he will pan out to be somebody and they get him for free. What do they have to lose? Absolutely nothing. And they have space on the roster that they could immediately inject him and see what they've got. And, and that's it for me, right? Like, I just, what, what's the point of the signing? I think the point is that it brings him into camp. Um, he was an RFA, so chances are you were going to work something out with him. Yeah. I don't blame him for wanting a one-way deal. It wasn't going to happen, right? Like, I think it's, this is the most obvious outcome you can get. I still am not convinced he makes it through waivers, but if he's in Providence, I think he's going to look great in Providence. I like the guy. I just am tired about, I'm tired of hearing about that 2015 draft. So maybe this was Don Sweeney trying not to completely let go of that draft yet. Maybe he's not ready. Who knows? Uh, And that, uh, that comment right there is what makes me say, let's move on to the next topic because I've seen it plenty and we're going to hear it more after this episode airs and I just can't take it anymore. So Let's talk next about the 13 nationally broadcast games the Bruins are going to play this year. Um, I'm excited and I'm not. So I'm going to kick this one off. I think the Bruins deserve to have nationally televised games. I think the NHL has done what was needed from a money perspective by bringing in ESPN. I'm not excited to watch hockey on ESPN. I'm just not. There's nothing about it that's exciting me. And there's nothing about ESPN so far that they've done that have made me think they're going to advance the game like they have for other leagues. So it's a bit disappointing to me, to be honest. And I know the season hasn't started, so maybe my point of view changes on that. But Yeah, I mean, I hear you. Um, And they they do have the 13 games that are going to be nationally televised. That They're tied with, I think, like maybe close to 10 other teams with 13 national games. Um, ESPN, I'm still in a, a funk with, um, not sure how I really feel about it. Good for the game, obviously, but I think Turner is really going to be 
the company that pushes the NHL forward. I was just watching the Packers game last night on ESPN, right? And I was flicking through the ESPN app and I was trying to just find some hockey stuff, right? Do you know how freaking hard it was to find NHL on the ESPN app? Like you guys are already bought in. The season is two to three weeks away. Why is it? Why is this stuff not showing up on your front page? Because it's just, they, they still don't care. Like, I, I don't know how else to explain this to people other than ESPN has never, nor will they ever truly care about hockey the way they do about other sports. And, and to me, that's the shame of the ESPN deal. And I get it. It's money and I get it. Okay. But how are you going to make more money off your product if you're not advertising for it? I, and, and, and that's fair. I mean, in the world of, you know, me nerding out for a minute in the world of web personalization, when Connor goes to the ESPN app, it should be showing him hockey because that's the primary thing he's going and looking at online. It's the thing he hosts a podcast about. It's the thing he writes about. Like there's so many things you do in relation to hockey that it's unacceptable at this point that ESPN doesn't put that experience in front of you for the size company they are. And that just tells me they're not bought in. And if they're not bought in fine, but at least we'll get some Bruins games on ESPN this year and we'll be able to watch our, our friend Patrice Bergeron lead the team to what is hopefully a, a deep run. In what may or may not be his last year. It's not going to be his last year. So let's, let's talk about this. Flawless segue. We're okay, in, right. Yeah. We're, we're in we're, mid season we're, form. We're, we're killing it. Um, so Bergeron is, has come out and said that he's going to play through the end of the season and make contract decisions after he's done the season. The only way Bergeron walks away from this game this year is if he wins the cup. That's the only way I see him walking away. That said, I was on the record even before the end of last season that I think Bergeron is year to year, not because he's going to play another four or five. I think you have Bergeron for another two or three. He's not the kind of guy that's going to play on the decline. And I am firmly sticking with that take. And I know that that upsets some people and it upsets me because the day he's done playing is going to be absolutely devastating. But this is not a Zidane O'Chara situation. He's not going to continue to play forever. He's going to prioritize his family and his home life and being good on his way out. So what are your thoughts, Connor? Are you aligned? Yeah, I hear you there. Um, I think if it ends this year, it's because they've won the cup or there's such a significant injury on his part that it just doesn't make sense to continue on. But in injury though, like the man's played through everything. Like I, I just don't know what injury he, like a a decapitation, like is his head going to come off through a skate? Like, but at what point does he say, you know, I'm on the, the lower 40, you know, coming towards 40 years old. I can't keep doing this, you know, and playing with, you know, punctured ribs or punctured lung and cracked ribs, whatever it was yeah. that playoff season, you know, at some point your body can't withstain or with, with stain. I, I don't even knows? know what I'm trying, Use to, a simpler what I'm trying word. to say. Your body can't take it anymore. Yeah. Whatever. Body can't <laughs> take it anymore. He's old. He's not Zidane Chara. And I think the, the biggest thing for me is I feel like this team is going to come close to bottoming out whenever he decides to move on because of because of this last off season this was the thing that i just is running through my mind as somebody who's a bruins fan before all else when bergeron t- retires what are we going to have at the center position and that scares the hell out of me yeah i mean you're going to have to hope one of your prospects comes up and makes it big, right? I mean, I, the the prospect pool as a whole, you and I have talked about this before, but it makes me terribly nervous. Like, I, it's just not where it needs to be. And I'm not even going to go as far as blaming 
Don Sweeney single-handedly for that. But like, if there were one thing I would say that people deserve to be upset with Sweeney about, it's the shape of your prospect pool for what you called several pushes for a cup win, but did what feels like the bare minimum to get to the cup. And, and, and that's probably me being too harsh, right. Or like revisionist history, like maybe, but that's the one thing that I sometimes have a bone to pick with Don Sweeney on is just the, that portion of the prospect pool just doesn't look great. I mean, you're going to get guys like Beecher, what they're a year or two out from playing in the bigs. I mean, well, he's still in college, so I guess you could transition like a Charlie McAvoy and hop right in, you know, at the end of the season. Beecher's playing at Michigan, which is completely loaded with talent. Yeah. So I would say it's probably better that he plays there instead of in Providence. But Agreed. you could argue it either way, and I could agree with you. Um, yeah, it's just without Bergeron. I almost want to say I see a team without an identity. Ooh, that's getting well. So actually then let's, let's transition flawlessly to another subject. Then you've got an alternate spot open now with Krejci's departure. Who's your alternate? Well, Marshan's already there. Yep. Bergeron already wears the C. McAvoy's got to wear the A. Well, so, you, so, okay. So let me give you my top three. And this, this is probably article worthy, to be honest, like to really dig into this from my point of view, but let me give you my top three and my whys to my top three. Okay. Number one, Brandon Carlo. I think he, for our YouTube viewers, that was going to be priceless. I have never seen Connor so much disagree with anything I've said. So, so let me, let me preface this with, I'm going to order it three to one. So, so this is a reverse order here. So Brandon Carlo would be one of the people I have in my top three. Okay. Here's, here's why. It's good to see that you're drinking early on a Tuesday morning. (laughs) Uh, Here's the thing. I'm not, first off, I'm not drinking early on a Tuesday morning. I wish I was, but I'm not. Um, I think that Carlo has the poise, the dedication, the calmness in the room that could be beneficial to an alternate position. That said, you also have that guy in Patrice Bergeron. So that's why he's top three for me. I don't know that that's what you need right now. Then you have the one-to-one replacement. You've got your Charlie Coyle's going to be your second line center. Absolutely not. Get <laughs> out of here. Oh my God. No. Well, let me, let me get through my reasoning. So Charlie Coyle, he's going to be a more outspoken leadership type. He's going to, you know, want you to play. He's going to motivate you. He's going to, he's going to be your locker room speech guy. But I'm also not sure you really need that because you have Brad Marshan. And I think he's equipped to get the, get the team amped up. Then you have your obvious choice, but I don't know it's going to be as obvious for Bruce Cassidy in Charlie McAvoy. He is the future of your franchise. But do you think that this is going to be a Bruce Cassidy decision or is this going to be an organization decision? I, get I think the, the feel- latter. And I get the feeling that it's going to be a Bruce Cassidy decision. I do, and here's why. I think that at some level, as the leadership starts to age, you have to, assuming you're going to move forward with Cassidy, your plan is to continue using Cassidy for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Then you have to give him the transition time. You have to give him the ownership of the transition. How are you going to take this team from Bergeron to McAvoy being your face of the franchise. And that's got to be on his shoulders. He's got to be the guy to make that transition. He's going to be the one at the presser every night. He's going to be the one having to deal with leadership in the room. Like at the end of the day, it has to be on him. And so if I'm the organization, unless he's going to make the wrong decision, 
I think you let him make the decision, right? And if you think he's going to make the wrong one, then maybe you step in. Yeah. So, Carlo, I, all, all I can say is I hope you had a fourth or a fifth because when he gets hurt and he can't play, you're going to need to give that A to somebody else. Ooh, wow. All right. Charlie Coyle doesn't deserve it with the way he's played. He might change my mind this season now that he's healthy. Not so sold on that. Obviously, as a Bruins fan, I'm hoping for the best. But I think everybody can see and understand that when Bergeron moves on, Charlie McAvoy is probably going to be the next captain of this team. Well, but we're no, hold on. And now's the time to bring him under Panith or, or under Panith. Patrice Bergeron. I'm struggling. Oh my God. <laughs> hey, hey, under it's Patrice the first episode Bergeron. back this season. Give yourself a break. And let him learn that letter on the chest mentality from the King of Boston himself. Sorry, Wait. Tom Brady, you moved to Tampa. You are no longer the King of Boston. Well, you're wearing a Yankee shirt, so you're a jackass. Um, anyways, like oh yeah. So old, this this sense. episode is now has to be marked as explicit because I couldn't contain myself. Oops. Um, anyways, so at the end of the day, there's somebody we're not talking about. And I thought this is where you were going. Nick Felino. <laughs> okay. I have seen that name floated on some people's lists. It's not an, it's not a ridiculous idea for a win now mentality. I'm considering this a transitional thing and maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's the way I'm treating this. David Pasternak was not on my top three. He's in my top four. He'd be my fourth guy in that list. Ah, uh, see, he can't manage to not get on rollerblades in the off season and jump off of a stanchion at a soccer game somewhere in Europe and roll his ankle. Like I, the guy just doesn't have the qualities to me to do it. In fact, he's the kind of player. I think I saw somebody say this on Twitter, right? He's the kind of player you like need to contractually tell, Hey, you can't be a stupid bozo is kind of the vibe I'm getting, but, um, I don't See, know. I think, I think it's, I think it's opposite of that. I think if you slap a letter on his chest, he can't be that, you know, free spirited gets everybody, you know, spirits up and laughing and having a good time because he's got to be the role model. He's got the letter on his chest. Let pasta be pasta. You don't need to slap an A on his Jersey. That, that's fine. I'm, I'm with you, but I don't know that the fan base would be as with you as you think. I mean, maybe this is worth a, a Twitter poll this week. Let's figure out, you know, who those yeah. folks would be for them. I, I have to think McAvoy takes first, but I would say pasta probably takes second for a lot of fans. And I, I could see why I just, I'm against putting a letter and having the letters on jerseys be on just your best players. I, I'm i with you. I mean, because I think you're right that Pasta doesn't have necessarily the leadership qualities, but it would detract from what he does bring to the team. Right. Like, do you think he comes out and acts a fool talking about that Barbie girl song at the, uh, the why Winter is that Classic acting game? a fool? I think that, listen, I mean, I'm not going to do this. No way in hell Patrice Bergeron would have walked out and said that with a letter on his chest. We I don't think Marshan would have walked out and done that with a letter on his chest. That's maybe pasta. Not, maybe not. But I mean, I don't know that he was acting a fool like that. Objectively speaking, that is a good song. So, I mean, I just I, I don't understand how we can go any further than that. In this conversation, I'm going to transition us right into the next topic before you can disagree with me because you're wearing a Yankee shirt, which means you've lost all boats. Uh, all right. So <laughs> where do we see the Bruins finishing in the division this year? And we're going to cover this a little bit later when we talk about betting, because obviously the season hasn't started. We're going to talk about futures. Um, but where do you see them finishing? What what, what do you have in, on your mind? Um. I don't know. This is going to be a really weird season. I think primarily because of the questions down the middle after Bergeron. Um, but just looking at the other teams in the division, such as Tampa, obviously Tampa lost their third line. So I think they're not going to be the powerhouse that everybody thought they were. 
they're going to be more like the Bruins of late than ever before, because now they've got a, a top line, a second line and some good defense, but the bottom six now is complete question marks, which is good for us. Yep. Um, then obviously you've got Toronto. I think Toronto is going to be Toronto. They're going to play a great regular season. They're going to dump it in the playoffs. And then the two big ones for me in my kind of thought process here is Florida and Montreal. I think Montreal is going to be in the top three in this division with what they did this off season. I think Florida is going to be the upset team. They're going to be a wild card to make it into the playoffs, but they're going to be the team that people take some losses to that starts dropping them down the standings. They're going to be that tough out. Yep. So I think the way that we're going to end the season is you're going to have Toronto one. Okay. Montreal two. Boston three. Tampa Bay four, Florida five. Wow. Wow. I'm not sure um, that the odds makers would agree with you, which is probably a good thing. Um, Cause if they did, our betting would be boring. Uh, I'm going to flip this a little bit and this is going to make Bruins fans heads explode. I think the Leafs take number one. And then I think they lose in the first round, but I think they take number one. I think the Bruins are second, the lightning are third and Florida is fourth. You don't even have Montreal in there at all at five. I have them in there at at five. five. Okay. So you really switched up. You just moved everything up one and threw Montreal on the bottom for me. Yeah. You had Toronto. I'm just jotting these down real quick. Then you uh, had so you Tampa. Call me, call me out on it later in the season. Excellent. I appreciate Absolutely. that. Thank so you, you had Toronto, then Tampa, then Boston. No. Or you had Boston second. Correct. Okay. Boston, Tampa Bay, Florida, and then Montreal. I honestly okay. think Tampa Bay has a little bit of an identity issue missing that third line. Like, I, I think it's going to really screw with them this year. Um, and they lost Tyler Johnson. Yeah. I mean, I just think that, frankly, I think Tampa Bay is actually in a little bit. I could see Tampa Bay being in that fifth spot and Montreal coming in. I really could. Like, I I think Tampa Bay could struggle this year. And I think Tampa Bay fans are going to have an absolute fit about it. And I am so looking forward to that. Yeah. And the bad part for a lot of these teams is going to be Jack Eichel still on the Sabres. So if he plays, <laughs> he might give you a random, you know, two to three losses in the middle of the season where we're in a division where Detroit and Buffalo, you better be beating those two teams every single time you play, or it's going to be a real bad last two weeks of the season. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that that's, that's worthy of noting, right? I mean, I don't think he starts the season in Buffalo. I think they're going to move him. But at this point, you're now getting Eichel midway through the season with recovery time for the surgery that he's saying he needs, right? Like, well, he's not getting it right now. But, but my point is, he's going he's to leave reporting. Buffalo. He's, he's going to leave Buffalo and he's going to get it. There's no way you really think at this point, and I am so freaking tired of talking about Jack Eichel, but your face is telling me so many things. You really think Jack Eichel starts the season in Buffalo. I'm starting to believe it more and more. Ooh. When they, when they didn't trade him over a month ago, when everything was, you know, all hot and bothered about him and the market was all up. Now you have teams that just don't have space. And all I get- the serious contenders who wanted him. Yep to help bolster that cup they're 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 out i get it i get it i hear you i am i'm not even saying i you know what you might be right Uh, sadly you might be right i mean we're what two and a half three weeks away from the season i think he's gonna start on the organization and they're going to ir him 
They're not going to let him have the surgery because they're going to hold on and hope that he can get traded because this is Buffalo. They're idiots. Let's remember this. They're going to put him on the roster, slap him on IR, and just pretend that nothing's happened. Well, but if they do that and they get through this season and they haven't moved him, he they're royally no clause. screwed next year. I've been saying this from the get-go that for – They're not that to, bad. This is Buffalo to Bruins can't fans. can't be that bad. This is to Bruins fans. Your best hope of this Jack Eichel fantasy that I will continue to stoke the fire for to watch you people go crazy, your only hope is he makes it through this season. Oh, I, I think can't. he is going to start on Buffalo. He's going to play on Buffalo. The only way that I see him getting dealt pretty quickly is if there's a huge injury on another team. Like say uh, a top two center goes down on a team that's got some flexibility and a lot of assets. Cough, cough, New York Rangers. Uh, I just, I, I, I can't with you. I, we, all right. I so think this now is, it's in injury mode. Unless this there's is, a huge this is a transition. In the league, he's not going to get. I, I can't with you. I, I can't. I can't. I literally cannot right now. I, I don't. You know what? Fine. They, they better move him before the season starts. Buffalo can't legitimately be that bad. And I'm not a Buffalo fan. So like they just, they can't be that bad. It's, it's unacceptable. It can't happen. I don't want it, but that's the perfect transition to our around the NHL segment. The new oh. segment around the NHL. Dun, dun, dun. I, I yeah. think we're going to skip making an intro song for that, but maybe. Uh, <laughs> all right. So Chara, let's start there because it's kind of Bruins, kind of around the NHL. It's a good transition piece. Chara signs with the Islanders. What do you? Let's start based on feelings. How do you feel about that, Connor? It's not like he went to Washington, where I was a little more heartbroken because it was fresh. It was new. Didn't expect him to leave the Bruins, to be honest. Um, but it's a team he's played for before. Um, it makes sense. Uh, Lou Lamarillo loves reuniting every elderly <laughs> statesman of the NHL in the island. I don't understand. <laughs> you think that the most aged veterans in the league are going to help you win a cup? Power to you. But I think Chara is going to be the number six, number seven defenseman there. Um, even after all the news started breaking that he's going there. And of course, it's Lou Lamarillo. Nobody knows what kind of contract he signed. Assumptions are one year league minimum again. Yeah. But they're still looking for help on defense. So mm -hmm. it doesn't totally make sense to me why you would sign Chara but then you're going to still go out and look to trade for another defenseman or sign another defenseman. I get it. You need depth, but the whole point of Chara not wanting to stay in Boston and why he went to Washington was because he was going to play. Well, so we're told we still don't, we still don't know the whole story behind that, but I'm not really looking to rehash the past. Listen, here's the one reason I was a little upset by it. And I think I caught people off guard on Twitter by being upset. The truth the truth of this is, and I don't know how to say this, so I'm just going to say it bluntly. I think this now removes the possibility from him signing a one-day contract with the Bruins because I think what he's doing here is he's end-capping his career where he started it, and that is his plan. Now, I have no like factual basis for believing that, but for a guy to go end-cap his career with the team he started – it makes me feel like he's taking a different sentimental path than I initially thought he was going to probably take with the Bruins. So with that being said, do you think that this would then kind of block him out of or deter him from coming and jo joining the Bruins front office or management team? I don't know the actual answer to that, but my gut instinct is telling me with however things ended between him and Don Sweeney and him end capping his career with where he started, it's making me feel like the, the sentimental portion he had for the love of the Bruins is waning while he still loves the city of Boston. So do I think ultimately he ends up working for the Bruins organization? Yes. Do I think he does it while Don Sweeney's the GM? 
I'm starting to become less convinced than I was before, especially with them bringing in Chris Kelly and Adam McQuaid, because now you've got two new, two new guys, two new blood, right? Mm -hmm. In the system. How soon do you need somebody else? Yeah. I hear you on that. I just think that for me, looking at the situation, you got to think that Chara's number goes up to the rafters. Yeah. I, I'm not going to disagree with that. Could the Chris Kelly and Adam McQuaid scenario, Ben Chara still wants to play. They still don't want him back on this blue line. So he decides to, you know what? I'm not ready to join your coaching staff. If it was offered to him, who knows or development team. And he's going back to play again. But for me, I feel like he's got to come back and sign a a David Backus, you know, one day contract with the Bruins, retire as a Bruin. Does he? And then your number goes to the rafters that year. Okay. So now you're, now you're, but, but now you're sweetening the pot for a lack of a better term, right? Like now you're telling him you are important enough that we're going to sign you to this one day's contract and send you straight to the rafters where before, before he went to the aisle, I thought, okay, he comes back, he signs a one day contract in Boston. He joins the org and then they retire him a couple of years after he joins the org. I guess I just thought of being more organic than maybe it feels like it's going to be. And that's disappointing to me. I, I have to think that something happened here that he decided to take a different sentimental road. And I could be wholly off base. Again, I have no fact or evidence backing this up. So my scenario is a for the fans scenario of the organization realizing this guy meant the absolute world to the city, the team and the organization and the fans. So no matter what happened, got to do right by him. And you have to at least offer that if he wants to turn it down and become the villain, in the place that oh, he's he was not going to do that because he wants king. to live here. So that's what I'm saying. Like, okay. I feel like, yeah, whoever isn't the person to meet halfway in this scenario is going to be the villain. And they're going to be crucified by the fans and the media around here. And it's going to be a big to do. And so you're saying that they're just going to meet in the middle and they're going to get this done like gentlemen. And I, I do Henry believe Lundquist. that. Let's so it's a little bit different of a scenario because he technically didn't play, but he went and signed a contract with another team after they bought him out. Yes. And still his number is going to be retired this season. You're, you're right. I, I, I don't disagree with you. I, you know what, you know what, you're, you're bringing me around to being a less pessimist, less pessimistic about it. I still think, Something happened there and I don't really love it, but I, I see where you're coming from. If you were to tell me, no, we're not going to retire his number the first year. That's the, the, we're only going to do that one time and it's going to be for 37. Okay. Understand. But I just feel like you have to, as what he did for the organization, you have to, in the city. Zidane like, Chara, in all honesty, of any Bruin, maybe that I can even think of, spent his time and his money, his money, on the city of Boston. He, he, especially around the holidays. Yes, I like, still. I, I don't know. I like you think of Zidane Chara Easter Bunny. Yep, from the hospital visits or delivering pies from Mike's pastries to soup kitchens, you know, around the holidays, etc. Like I will be upset if the Bruins fumble this as an organization. And and I guess that's why maybe I felt so upset by him going to the Islanders because I felt like he was having to end cap his career in the way I didn't want him to end cap it. And maybe that's all this is, right? Like you could, you could totally be right. This could all work out and it could be fine. And all of this will have been, all of this panic will have been for nothing. But I mean, that was a, that was a long segment on, on a guy signing. So let's talk next. Why don't you walk through a couple of the contracts um, 
that got signed here in the last couple yeah. of weeks and, and talk us through that while I eat this pretzel. Okay. You enjoy that one pretzel. Uh, so I'm going to start off in Canada. Kyler Yamamoto signed with Edmonton one year, 1.175 million AAV. Then Logan Brown signs with Ottawa one year league minimum, 750,000. And then Nolan Patrick, who was traded to Vegas in that three-way trade this off season, signs a two year, $1.2 million AAV. Now, do you have any, any comments on any of those three? I think my comment on all of those is similar in that I don't have an issue with price. I don't have an issue with term. I have an issue with the fact that those players would sign at that price in that term. <laughs> yeah. I mean, looking at the style of player, I feel like Jake DeBrusque barely should be gaining more than them. And I, and I guess and that's what I meant. Overpaid by, by 2 million. Well, okay. So but in that scenario, but then, so, so this is where we have to talk about the context of the NHL, right? Like COVID. these players taking this money means two things. One COVID and the, the financial situation of the league. But in addition to that, it means it sets the bar for players like DeBrusque who are coming into a contract year who are going to have to look at what it is they're worth, right? Like you could see a player like DeBrusque having to take a significant pay cut regardless of where he ends up next, even if he were to perform to the level he thought he could perform to. Like, this is where the NHL is going to get interesting, right? If the salary cap doesn't go up enough, quickly enough here, we're going to start to see some players sign some deals longer term that are for way less money than you think they should be. And that to me actually isn't good for the sport. And that's my biggest concern. It could go both ways. So the good for the sport business, look at Nathan McKinnon, Patrice Bergeron, uh, Pasternak, Marshan. You know, they're all in that $6 million range as some of the best players in the league. Has that hurt your sport? No. Absolutely but has not. it helped grow your sport? Are they, are they superstars like your NBA guys or your NFL quarterbacks? Are they... Are they superstars to the point where like you can walk down the street and somebody that doesn't, uh, I mean, so certain people, yes, like your Patrice Bergeron, your yeah. Nathan McKinnon, right? Like people know who those people are, but like, if I stopped a random stranger seven out of 10 times, they're going to be able to tell me who Patrice Bergeron is mm -hmm. 10 out of 10 times. They're going to be able to tell me who LeBron James is. Oh, Absolutely. But I don't think that that's a money problem in the league. I think that is a advertising and partnership issue. I don't think that that's, that's done on how much money that person makes each year. I mean, look at Austin Matthews and Connor McDavid. They make boatloads of money. But if you ask somebody on the streets here who Connor McDavid is or who Austin Matthew is, they're probably going to be hit or miss if they know yeah. who they are. I mean, I guess my point is though, like this is a reflection of the league's overall financial health, right? Like the salary cap is a reflection of your league's financial health. I think that the NHL needs to be doing more to be competing with those other leagues. And I'm not saying you need to pay a guy $600 million a year or not a year, but in a contract, right? Like, Maybe you do need to pay him $600 million a year. Some of these guys are getting their heads taken off every night. So like, I, it's just, I think that until this sport takes their salary cap and their cap management and their superstar statuses to the next level, which I'm sure is what they were hoping for with the ESPN deal. But I they're just, too busy showing LeBron James every five seconds. Exactly. And so I don't know. I mean, I just so, think if your players are signing bigger contracts, they make bigger splashes, right? People have that, whoa, look how much money that is. Like, 
Does anybody go, whoa, look how much money that is when McAvoy signs an $11 million deal next year? Probably not. Not outside yeah. of the hockey community. So I want to take a quick detour because we're, we're talking about it a lot. I think we should actually give it the conversation. The state of the NHL, as far as cap, income, et cetera, they set up with the two new U.S. partners. They're about to have to go through another TV deal in Canada. I believe it's within the next two years. Um, helmet ads are staying. Jersey ads, barf, are on the way. Gambling partnerships are supposedly coming down the line with all the new things that we've got going on in the NHL to the point where this five-year flat cap has turned into a, it might go up by a million dollars a year, maybe more. Now, Bill Foley went on the 31 Thoughts podcast. I barely got to listen to his interview the other day while driving around town. Um, and he said that there is flexibility where they could reopen negotiations to increase that $1 million a year cap increase. They have to. So what I'm trying to get at is where is this money really coming from? I understand that Seattle just paid $600 million, I think it was, to enter the league, and that gets dispersed across the teams. Okay, get that. Every team gets some helmet ad money. Okay, that might pay two league minimum contracts maybe. Who knows? Now you're going to throw jersey ads in. Do I agree with it? No. I would rather have just a regular plain old jersey and keep that the way it is. If you want to fill the ice up with dumbass ads, go for it. But why the jersey? That being said, I don't want to argue about it because I think that's stupid to argue about. But at what point does the NHL stop and say, you know what? It's time for us to have a luxury tax. Yeah, I mean, fine. Because, I mean, if you look at it, all these other sports that are, you know, the big getters on ESPN and they make a lot of money, they have absurd contracts, they all have a luxury tax. And you know what? That's really going to suck for teams, you know, that are in a pinch like Arizona, maybe Carolina. You know, who knows if Dundon wants to open his pocketbook like that, but. You're going to get teams like the Maple Leafs, the Red Wings, the Bruins, Chicago, LA. They'll spend absurd amounts of money to stay competitive. The Maple Leafs might sign every single player in the league (laughs) if they could get away with it. They already do it with the Marlies and burying like 60 million contracts. But the good thing about the luxury tax is that money would be dispersed to the other teams in the league. Right. To help them spend that money. And that would also add into that chunk of new revenue to help your cap go up. Are you, are you going to have the, the closeness in the dog fights in the standings like you do now? No, probably not. Because a few years back, if this was the case, Toronto would have signed Steven Stamkos and then still continue to sign John Tavares. And they would have, an NHL all-star team because they don't care about money at that point. Right. But my, my question, right. And maybe and that's what where, the Maple Leafs need to finally win a Stanley cup. And it's still probably not. Um, but, but here's the, here's the challenge as a true and tried hockey fan, the concept disgusts me. And I think for the majority of our listeners, the concept disgusts them, but the truth of the matter is, do you want to grow the league? Yes or no. Right. The league has to financially sustain and these billionaire owners need to make more billions for the league to sustain, which means the players need to make more, which means the advertisers need to make more. And I don't see a way around it, but to start to inject more money into the game. And hell, I hope I'm wrong. I'm hoping that this grassroots effort of like teams like the Bruins going and building roller rinks all around the state is going to be what you know, shifts gears and puts hockey in the prime spotlight, but it just, 
I think we've proven at this point that that's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's life, right? Like that's just the way it is. Interestingly, I guess, you know, kind of for our final NHL topic before we switch to some quick gambling, the 2022 Olympics and the NHL's commitment to the Olympics. What are your thoughts to that? I'm hopefully optimistic. Um, I really want to believe that the NHL is going to send the players to the Olympics. Um, I think it's going to be more political than anything. If they don't, I think it's going to be, we're going to keep our players out and we're going to blame it on COVID because we think that we want to do whatever for our own revenues. Okay. I get it. The bad part is I feel like if the players don't go to the Olympics, we're going to be in for another lockout within the next five years. A big one, because the players are willing to take on a lot of the financial ramifications for insurance and things like that because of COVID, because they so desperately want to go. Right. Now, one of the things that's really confusing to me, and maybe this is smoke and mirrors, is the, the NHL as a whole has been trying to tap into that Chinese market. They've been sending teams over there to have exhibition games, play hockey with the kids, etc. And then they canceled the last Olympic trip. And everybody said, oh, well, they'll never cancel on China. No way that they cancel on China. That's where they want to get into, just like the MLB and the NBA. Okay, I get that. Everything they're saying right now doesn't give me that jive that they're going to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get, what, I, I get what you're saying. Here's the reason I think they follow through this time. Players would just absolutely lose their minds if they don't follow through. I mean, the players are ultimately the ones that really want this, right? Like they're the people that are, are dying to do this. They've given so many concessions to the NHL through this COVID period. There's no way the NHL can get away with not sending them. In addition to the fact that I do legitimately feel it's good for the game. Because there are people who are going to watch the Olympics that don't watch the NHL season. And maybe they find that passion or love for the sport that all of a sudden you've got some more viewership. Now, is it going to shift everything on its head? No, but it's going to make your players happy and it's going to give you exposure. It would be stupid not to go. Yeah. And the other thing that I actually just started thinking about is if you go to the Olympics, you're going to get broadcast to all these other folks who now will be like, oh, wow, that was pretty good. Let me go watch a game. Previously, in most scenarios, a lot of people don't have the best TV packages, right? Because it's so goddamn expensive. So you would go and you would be like, oh, this game's on NBCSN. Click. Oh, well, shit. <laughs> it's not part of my TV package. I can't watch it. I have to have one of the higher tiers. Okay, well, guess what? TNT and ESPN is on every basic cable package that I'm aware of around yeah. here. So they'll be easily, if they have cable or YouTube TV or whatever the hell you have, you'll be easily going over and watching NHL content. I feel like you're really dropping the ball if you don't go to the Olympics in so many different ways. I think that the 2022 China Olympics is crucial for the existence of the NHL over the next 10 years. I I mean, I, I would wholly agree with that. I think that it's, it's what you need to do for the health of your sport right now. And I think it would be foolish not to go. I think the players would be so pissed that you'd have big problems on your hand. And I think they're going. So I I, listen, I think they're going to the Olympics. I think we can leave it at that. The NHL has a board of governors meeting. We'll probably find out more. We may not. They've got quite a few topics on the table, but I'd imagine we will. I think in terms of kind of wrapping up this segment for today, The NHL, like we said, is going to become a big part of our conversation um, for the podcast. We'll make sure that we bring you as much news as we can 
for the NHL. You obviously noticed we still tied it back to the Bruins quite a bit. Sorry, we're Bruins fans. It's going to be the way it is. But um, hopefully, hopefully that was, you know, some additional news that we could we could bring to the table. So the last segment of the show will be fairly short today because there's no NHL hockey to bet on. Um, but I figured over the next couple of episodes, we'd break up this conversation. So for my gambling corner today, I really want to touch on only one topic. And that topic is the NHL exact final matchup. So this year, we'll continue to use betonline.ag for all of our odd settings so that we're all looking at the same odds. Whether or not you gamble there, your decision. But, you know, we will use this for odd setting and discussing in the podcast. So NHL exact final matchup is something that I really enjoy betting on. And I think it's great that Bet Online has it this year. That said, I'm going to read you off their top three because as a Bruins fan, I expect, you know, vomit emojis in my replies on Twitter. Tampa Bay Lightning versus Colorado Avalanche plus 1,500. Tampa Bay Lightning versus Vegas Golden Knights plus 1,800. The Toronto Maple Leafs versus the Colorado Avalanche plus 2200 what the actual hell is that so this is potential stanley cup final matchups correct i think none of those three will happen correct lay off all three of those bets was going to be my advice but i am absolutely nauseous by the fact that that's where our odds are right now now let me go four through six because i think this will help people feel better Boston Bruins versus Colorado Avalanche, plus 2,500. Toronto Maple Leafs versus Vegas Golden Knights, plus 2,800. But the matchup I'm hoping for, and sixth overall, the Boston Bruins versus the Vegas Golden Knights, plus 3,300. It's not a great bet. I'm not going to tell you to take this on the show. I am going to tell you right now, as we wrap up this episode, I will be placing this bet today because I absolutely love the idea of a Vegas Bruins final and a plus 3,300 at a half unit. I could still make decent money. So yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm not sure that I would advise others to do it, but can we just recap that the Tampa Bay lightning and Toronto Maple Leafs have four of the top six spots. So I think Tampa and Toronto will not make it to the Stanley cup final. Neither of them will. Do I think that that means the Bruins will? No, no, I, I do not. I, I put a poll out uh, on our Twitter page the other day or yesterday. It was about where people thought the Bruins were going to finish. And I voted conference final and they're out. I voted second round exit. Second round exit. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I mean, what's crazy and just kind of talk about that in a gambling sense is aside from the avalanche, I don't see any team in the league that stands head and shoulders above everybody else. Right. Where previously you've seen like the golden Knights, Tampa avalanche and the Bruins, they kind of sat above the other teams because they had all the right pieces in place. Yep. That's not, that's not how it is this year. So even looking through some of the, the teams here, I don't even see a single Eastern conference team that jumps off the sheet where I say that that should be a Stanley cup favorite. I don't. So then, then your advice to listeners is to lay off this bet altogether, correct? Just because of how murky the divisions are going to be, I, I think the East is going to be a complete crapshoot. Yes, agreed. I think that's actually exactly what makes placing a bet in this category very difficult. But the reason I gave the pick I gave is because I'm a Bruins fan, right? If you're listening to this and you're a Bruins fan, Bruins versus Golden Knights isn't 100% impossible. The odds on Bruins versus the Avalanche are probably better. Well, they are better, literally, by the odds. But I think 
the upside is also a little bit less and I just don't want to play with that. So, I mean, my mm-hmm. advice, don't take this bet this year, even though I love it. My unsolicited, if you want to be a little silly with a half unit, take the Bruins versus the Golden Knights. It's at good odds right now. Again, these will shift before the season starts even likely. How many do they have on there? Just out of curiosity. Oh, I mean, if you wanted to go crazy, I mean, they've got probably almost a hundred. Okay. I'm just curious if you can find it real quick. Sure. Avalanche versus the Rangers. All right. Well, now you're just being stupid. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. Give me a minute. I will find this for you. That's Avalanche, my, so the Avalanche Rangers versus are my the Rangers. Dark horse. Okay. Well, the Rangers still... are my dark horse in the East because of the parody. In the then East buddy, East. let me help you. Plus 4,500. It's what not far rank down. was that in the list? It's uh, not far. It is 13. Dang. So I'm, yeah. I'm not far off, but yeah. And it's, I, and it's bundled with an, so it's the same odds as the Islanders versus the Golden Knights. Huh. I mean, I think, Hey, Connor, you, you, you should hit that one. I mean, again, it's one of those half unit folks, please, please remember NHL futures, half unit, no more. Like, for the love of all things holy, do not yeah, be betting three no. units on these on these bets. Um, but yeah, I mean, take it; it'll be fun. I think we'll, we'll we'll track a couple of these at the end of the year and let you know how we hit on our future odds in a in a later episode. But I think those are a couple of decent ones to take if you're willing to lose a half unit. Absolutely. And if you win, hell, that's a that's a great payout. So. Hmm. All right. Well, I think that's it for today. We'll, we'll talk gambling a little bit more uh, as the season gets closer. And then obviously when the season's here, we'll do Bruins gambling. We'll do NHL gambling. I might mix in a couple of uh, overseas bets as well with the whole David Krejci thing going on. So let's see where that goes, but um, thank you everyone for listening. We're excited to be back. We're having a blast. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Andrew Taverna. And you can find me at Connor Green 777. And we will see you later this week. Welcome back to season two. We will talk to you soon.